About 200,000 years ago, anatomically modern humans started spreading out of here and getting all over the place. This was such a long time ago and the world was such a different place that it's hard to imagine. We all have common ancestors that go back varying amounts of time, but there was a man alive about 300,000 years ago that we're all descended from. There was nothing special about him, and there were thousands of other men who still have living descendants, but the thought of humankind being linked in time even though we've spread across the globe and billions of us cannot successfully communicate with billions of others is rather humbling. There was a large gulf of time between our anatomically modern species emerging and civilization forming. With civilization, paleoanthropology begins to give way to history, and since we're all the same species but not all the same culture, it's appealing to try to find strange coincidences, or things that two disconnected cultures have in common. Do these things speak to something intrinsic about human beings? More tantalisingly still, what if ancient civilizations weren't the result of different races randomly spawning on an empty map with no connection to each other? What if transcontinental interaction was a thing divorced from conquest and colonisation as we think of it now? To some, the anthropological holy grail would be finding proof of transatlantic contact, and indeed there have been attempts to show that such contact was possible. In 1992, a German research team led by chemist Dr Svetlana Balabanova revealed something extraordinary. An analysis of Egyptian mummies that showed that in the hair, bone and soft tissue of those mummies were traces of nicotine and cocaine. For the folks who longed for proof of pre-Columbian contact between Africa and South America, this was more than they could have hoped for. Cocaine and nicotine are derived from plants native to the Americas. Coupled with the idea that a transatlantic crossing was possible, we'll get to that, this seemed too good to be true. Actually, was it too good to be true? Grab a cup of your favourite tea and let me tell you a story about hope, the value of weighing evidence, and the ability to make logical leaps that cross an entire ocean. When asked what piece of evidence could falsify Darwin's model of evolution through natural selection, scientist John Haldane quipped, rabbits in the Precambrian. In other words, the discovery of mammalian fossils about 200 million years before the first mammals are presently thought to have lived. A find of that type would be so astounding it would require an astounding explanation. I hardly need to reiterate that the gaps in our knowledge about ancient Egypt will tend to give birth to outlandish theories about the culture and historical events that surround it. Some of these theories are motivated by laziness, the desire to whip out an explanation without any support from the evidence. Some are motivated by worse instincts. Racism explains quite a few reasonably well-known ideas about ancient Egypt, such as aliens constructing the pyramids and the idea of an Arab great replacement that means modern Egyptians were not the descendants of the ancients. Or, more bizarrely, that northern Egyptians are somehow less genetically Egyptian than those who live upriver. Some of these fringe hypotheses, or as we might call them crank theories, are motivated not by a lack of evidence or by willfully ignoring evidence, but by evidence that shows up unexpectedly. Evidence that, at first glance, is very surprising or impossible to put into context. Precambrian rabbits, in other words. In almost all of these cases, the explanation will turn out to be far less sensational than first assumed, because we all like a bit of drama, even in the sciences. Egyptology has been prone to this sort of conclusion leaping, though I don't think more so than any other branch of the humanities. It's just that the ancient Egyptians are subject to an awful lot of misrepresentation in the popular media, and being exoticised because of their very distinctive language, religion and architecture. We know just enough about them to fill in what we aren't sure of with our own fantasies, a little knowledge really is a dangerous thing. But how do we separate the outlandish theories from the reasonable ones? What makes a theory reasonable? Let's talk about a device we should all be using every day. If I had a sponsor that would be a fairly reasonable segue into a VPN or something, but no, I'm talking about Occam's razor. This little intellectual tool is often misrepresented as telling us that the simplest explanation is usually correct. But that's not quite it. 
The point of Occam's razor is to remind us that when explaining a phenomenon, or fitting a piece of evidence into a bigger picture, we shouldn't add complexity to our explanation, or explain beyond what's necessary. If I walk into a room and see an empty bowl of cat food and a happily sleeping cat nearby, then I have a few explanations before me. Maybe my neighbours broke in and ate the cat food, maybe it was aliens, maybe ghosts took possession of the meat and are now slapping about the place somewhere making an awful mess, but all of these explanations require me to add new evidence or new phenomena to the world, except for one. My cat, whose food it was, ate it and is now having a well-deserved nap. Until something happens that the most grounded model can't explain, I'm intellectually obliged to choose the simplest one. If I should see a little meat man running around making ghost sounds, then I'm obliged to consider it disruptive to my regressive cats eat cat food model. The difference between limiting complexity when modelling phenomena and accepting the simplest explanation is that simplicity is deceptive. To some, it seems very simple that an advanced alien race could pile stones into a pyramid shape, but in reality that's actually a very complex theory. First, you need to establish the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations, which we can't. Second, you need to establish their interest in humankind, which we can't. You need to explain why their interest is limited to actually quite mundane accomplishments, and why the Egyptians never mentioned contact with them, and so on and so on. Occam's Razor asks us to embrace simplicity, but not laziness. It tells us to resist jumping to conclusions until the evidence opens those conclusions up to us. A pre-Cambrian rabbit fossil would not cause evolutionary biologists to panic. Well, maybe a little bit. It would definitely require a revision of the timeline of evolution as we understand it. Or, more likely, a reanalysis of the evidence. Because experimental error, either with the methodology or in the interpretation of the results, probably explains as many weird results as are explained by something actually weird happening. Can the pyramid's existence be explained simply through human ingenuity and tremendous amounts of manual labour? Yes. There's nothing about the pyramids that's so mysterious that only a technologically advanced civilization could have built them. Certainly not an alien one. Now, if tomorrow a visiting tourist accidentally speaks the password that makes the Great Pyramid hover a hundred metres off the ground and pulsate with intermittent microwaves, then we'll talk. We all fail to apply Occam's razor from time to time, we're all subject to biases when interpreting evidence. This is especially true in subjects like archaeology, linguistics and history, where repeated statistical analysis or replication of results is not always possible. But Occam's razor applies even then. It isn't a perfect tool, because no tool is perfect once humans lay their hands on it, and it isn't a truth serum that can magically tell us what's true, because there can always be a black swan, a piece of evidence we haven't found, that won't fit into our model when we do find it. It's pretty subjective, since its effectiveness is always relative to what each person interpreting the evidence thinks of as a less complex explanation, but it's a template for how to approach unexpected phenomena, and it stood the test of time. So, let's all try to keep the razor in hand as we look at a phenomenal bit of evidence for something that probably never happened. Cocaine is an alkaloid extracted from plants native to South America. It can be extracted through chemical processes, resulting in the cocaine salt that's commonly thought of in recreational circles, and is probably the thing you're picturing right now. It can also be extracted from these plants directly by the human body, and the chewing of coca leaves has been, and continues to be, a central practice of the indigenous cultures in that region. The Inca colonised so much territory in large part because they wished to control as much of the coca-bearing land as possible. This was because of the coca leaf's ability to give people the strength and endurance necessary to engage in tiring physical work for longer than they would have done otherwise. <laughs> There's even evidence that they recognised its anaesthetic properties, and may have used it in that way for surgical purposes. This evidence comes in part from mummies both artificially and naturally created throughout South America. Of course this continuous use of coca came with a downside. When the Spanish invaded South America, coca was quickly recognised as an intoxicant, and the locals were forbidden from consuming it. Pretty quickly, withdrawal kicked in, and those locals found themselves unable to work as hard. 
naturally the conquistadors, wanting to exploit the indigenous labour and also make a profit, reintroduced coca to the masses and taxed its use. Thus began a cycle of the exploitation of indigenous Americans that has yet to end. Yay. Nicotine is another alkaloid, also a stimulant, but it's a bit more common than cocaine. While it's associated with tobacco, it's also found throughout members of the nightshade family, which contains a huge number of plants that see everyday use, including tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, aubergines, tea leaves, celery. None of these plants possess the chemical in amounts large enough to produce nicotine psychoactive effects. Some of the ones I've mentioned have as little as a million times less nicotine than tobacco. Actually, nicotine's biological function is a clue to why it might have been found on the mummies, I'll get to that in a bit. This video is mostly going to focus on cocaine because, as I've hopefully demonstrated, while nicotine shows up all over the place in various concentrations, cocaine is much less widespread. Nowadays, cocaine is the byproduct of many perfectly lawful extraction practices, and quite a few unlawful ones, and it comes from South America. So imagine the surprise when traces of it were found in the tissues of ancient Egyptian mummies. The story begins with a German team of researchers, led by forensic chemist Dr. Svetlana Balabanova. They analysed the tissues of the remains of nine ancient Egyptians, seven heads and two complete adult mummies, and found traces of cocaine, nicotine and hashish in almost all of the mummies. In a follow-up study a year later, they looked at 11 mummies from a range of ages from infancy to adulthood, across a range of ages from the late period to the Roman period. I'm the cleverest boy in the world! The methods they used are just slightly outside of my fluent comprehension, so I will name them for your own entertainment and you can look them up in your own time. Radioimmunoassay, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Wow, chemistry A-level flashbacks. The salient point is that these methods, verified since, were the same used at the time to establish drug use for criminal cases. I'm going to focus on the second study, the 1993 study. It focused on complete mummies, it analysed a few more mummies than the original, and the results were published in English, which is pretty helpful for me. So let's start simply. Don't worry too much about the numbers on screen, I'm going to go through them as best I can, so bear with me. Here are the amounts of the drugs that were found in the Egyptian samples. I suspect these numbers don't mean much to you. They didn't mean much to me on first glance. The first thing is, of course, that the cocaine number isn't zero, which is probably what we would expect. Something to bear in mind about these numbers. They're very low. The original findings were published in nanograms per gram, that is, how many nanograms of the drug were found on average per gram of the sample tested. Modern drug tests use nanograms per milligram, so in a modern drug test, a result of 100 nanograms per gram in a hair sample would be rendered as 0.1 nanograms per milligram. Usually, and it does vary from place to place, to distinguish a positive cocaine test result from negative, most labs would look for at minimum 0.3 nanograms per milligram, which is 300 nanograms per gram. You can see that most of the Balabanova mummies fell far short of this threshold. These mummies are, legally, cocaine free. Now, if you're thinking at this point what I was, then you're probably thinking there must be a difference between an Egyptian mummy and a living person, on whom most drug tests are performed. An Egyptian mummy was heavily processed prior to entombment with chemical and physical methods that aren't entirely known to us. So it's not as though a mummy is a perfect biochemical record of a living person anyway, not compared to an actual living person or a fresh cadaver. To try to put these facts into context, Balabanova and her team compared their analysis of Egyptian mummies with samples taken from living persons whom they knew to be active drug users, and naturally occurring Peruvian mummies. Tissue samples were also compared with those from the so-called Bell Beaker culture, originating in Central Europe in the 3rd millennium BCE, and much older Sudanese remains, dating back to between the 5th and 6th millennia BCE, far older than the Egyptian mummies. Do note that the Bell Beaker remains and the Sudanese remains were skeletal, so the only samples that were taken from these were from the bone. I have trimmed some of the results out for the sake of brevity. One of the reasons I'm doing this is simply that 
these aren't my findings to publish. The more detail I go into presenting other people's findings, the more likely I am to misrepresent them. It is quite important to note that the Munich team presented these results without any active speculation about how the substances came to be in the mummies. So that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm not a biochemist, so while I've done as much reading around these things as I think I need to, both to understand the various interpretations on offer and present them to you in a coherent way, there's a source document linked in the description. If you want things from the horse's mouth, that's the place to start. If I haven't cited something, it's because I got the info from Wikipedia, things like where certain plants are found around the world. That's encyclopedia stuff, not peer-reviewed study stuff. So there are definitely some interesting things going on with these numbers. From the two sets of Sudanese remains, no cocaine or hashish was found. That makes sense. At the time these people died, hashish was still to be found only in Asia. Some nicotine, okay, well there are some explanations for that, but for now we'll look at this result, shrug and say, maybe they ate some sort of heirloom celery, and move on. It's interesting that there's a difference between the Sudanese and Egyptian mummies, given that they're from very similar locations, but again, the numbers for the Egyptian mummies are tiny. The same null point are to be had from the Balbika folks, with a tiny amount of nicotine that again, was probably dietary. For someone who smokes or chews tobacco on the reg, the result would look more like 2000 nanograms per gram, which none of the Egyptian mummies come close to. The reason I'm focusing on the hair result is because hair preserves drug use really well. In an earlier paper, Balabanova was able to prove that when cocaine is detected in human hair tissue, it's not a metabolite, that is to say, it's not something that cocaine becomes in the human body the way it would be if they tested blood or urine, it actually is the cocaine itself, which can give a much more accurate benchmark for how much cocaine a person is using, and how long ago. There is an intriguing tidbit that we should bear in mind, assuming we can take these findings as evidence of the actual use of the substance. In a later analysis of natural mummies from the Nubian region, Balabanova found that younger remains, that is, the remains of infants and children, showed more cocaine in their tissues than those of adults. Could this indicate that cocaine was a component in ancient Egyptian obstetric pain relief? If so, it could easily make it into infants via the placenta or postnatally through breast milk. Or else we might imagine cocaine being very useful as a teething salve. Either way, the fact that the results show signs of decreased use through age gives us the impression that the use was deliberately applied and not just a byproduct of the mummification process, although we can't dismiss that completely with so much of the chemical side of mummification unknown. Right away we can see that the levels in the Peruvian mummies are comparable to the living active drug users. This is really helpful, it tells us that the cocaine doesn't degrade significantly over time. We should also note that the Peruvian mummies were dated to between 200 and 1500 CE, so not much overlap with the Egyptian mummies, but it certainly looks like factors other than time determine the levels of cocaine found in the hair. With the living users as a baseline for how much to expect in the tissues of a cocaine user, and the Peruvian mummies showing that cocaine sticks around even after many centuries, we can make a bit more sense of the Egyptian results. Jesus, I'm saying cocaine so much in this video, it's almost a good thing I'm not big enough to be monetized. Of course I hope that one day I will be and get that sweet sweet pennies on the pound ad revenue streaming in, making it rain tiny little copper coins. But if I were eligible for ad revenue or sponsorship, videos like this probably wouldn't get either of them. And that's why I'm proud that this video, like all my videos, is brought to you by my backers on Patreon. When I make a longer video, I draw a name out of the Patreon hat to thank them, but it's been a while, so I'll draw two and bring those mighty names before the altar of thanks. Thank you, Ken Pointer. Go forth with my blessing that you live, prosper, and thrive. And thank you, Think Cork. Go forth with my blessing that you live, prosper, and thrive. May both your deeds be celebrated, your names be glorified, and your transgressions overlooked. If you want your name here and in the credits of all my videos, you can become one of my founding backers at patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. I have tiers as low as £1 and as high as £50, and there's a range of benefits from Discord roles and shoutouts to voting rights and even physical gifts. 
If you don't fancy being a backer right now or don't have the funds for it, consider subscribing if you haven't already so you're more likely to be notified when I publish a new video. I'm trying to get to the humble but doable goal of a thousand subs by the end of January, which will be my channel's anniversary. I'll be commemorating that anniversary with a video I'm pretty excited to share with you, particularly because it's let me work with one of my favourite YouTubers. Long story short, this channel means a lot to me and so does your support. Whether you're a regular viewer, a subscriber, a Patreon backer or any combination of those things. Thank you so much and on with the show. So okay, clearly the Egyptians weren't using as much cocaine as indigenous South Americans, but how were they using any at all? The methods used to test them were fairly reliable in detecting these substances. The initial findings were generated using forensic methods, specifically accurate enough to stand up in court, but we can't necessarily apply the same methods to ancient samples that we would to modern samples. The longer something has been around, the more things can happen to it. Not a complex scientific principle I'll grant you, but essentially accurate. Anything can be contaminated, either in situ with processes like decomposition, fermentation, oxidation, or in the laboratory, particularly with equipment that, say, tests for cocaine regularly. I definitely don't want to leave you all with the impression that experimental error is a euphemism for incompetence. In this case it certainly isn't. Dr. Balabanova, who participated in both cocaine mummy studies and led the first one, was, at the time, a pioneer in developing reliable methods for forensic drug testing using hair samples. It's just that you really can't assume that a method that works on recent samples points to the same thing when used on ancient samples. Over a long period of time, chemistry can happen. In unexpected ways, particularly where complex organic molecules are concerned, because let's face it, carbon will do anything with anyone. We already don't know the chemical composition of everything used in mummification, and so we don't know what happens to those chemicals when given time to denature, oxidise, be fermented, and so on. Mummies from other museums, tested in other labs, have found no cocaine, which tends to make us think that there was something about the cocaine mummies that was different, either because of where they were stored or where the tests were performed. In a paper which in part responds to the Balabanova studies, David Council quips that when the mummies were in the private collection of the King of Bavaria, it is, quote, not implausible that contamination could have occurred there. If anyone out there is imagining Irene Adler snorting coke off a mummy while the king crumps to chamber music in the background, we are soulmates. Find me. What do you mean that was Bohemia? Oh, f anyway, contamination and false positives are very real. Many quite common medicines and medical conditions can account for a positive result in a hair or urine analysis. When you consider the guilty until proven innocent culture that prevails around drug testing, and that a failed drug test can put people's jobs on the line, that's quite worrying. So let's put a pin in the idea of experimental error. We can't be sure that's the explanation. Uh, for one thing, Cancel's paper is based on the premise that cocaine can only be found in species inhabiting South America. Assuming that were true, experimental error would be a pretty comfortable explanation for the existence of the cocaine mummies. But what if that weren't true? If we sideline the idea of experiment error to consider other options, we're left with two main possibilities. Either the ancient Egyptians got their cocaine from South America, or they got it from somewhere else. After all, from a certain point of view, there are only two places in the whole universe, South America and everywhere else. And wouldn't that be amazing? And wouldn't it explain the indigenous Mesoamerican love of pyramids? Yes, to a certain variety of fringe historian, it's obvious that either extraterrestrials or ancient Egyptians helped to build the Mayan and Aztec pyramids. Never mind that those things were built a long time after Egypt had stopped building pyramids, and they were made in very different ways for very different purposes. And again, pyramids are just a thing people can build, probably more so if you're chewing coca leaves. The one thing all crank historians seem to agree on is that indigenous Americans absolutely cannot build their own damn pyramids. Spectacular. Highly racist. Don't stop on my account, though also, please, stop. Okay, so the Egyptian source of cocaine was either South America or somewhere else. 
to figure out which explanation asks less of us, remember Occam's razor? We need to figure out whether the Egyptians could have gone to South America, if they would have done, and whether they did. In 1970, Norwegian explorer Tur Heyerdahl took an international crew across the Atlantic from Morocco to Barbados in the boat Ra 2, which was made as far as could be known with materials and methods used by the ancient Egyptians. The journey was a mixed success. Yes, the crew was able, with only minimal nautical experience among them, to exploit the canary current to boost them across the ocean. But the boat got lost along the way and needed to be rescued. The ancient Egyptians would have had to make that journey and then back again to import coca leaves to the Nile Valley. Bear in mind this was a crew who knew where South America was, what direction to sail and how far away, which ancient Egyptian explorers would not have done. The ancient Egyptians were usually fairly averse to expeditions of this kind, preferring international trade to come to them. Which of course it always would, since the Nile Delta is a sort of three-way border between Africa, Asia and Mediterranean Europe. When Egypt was proactive in establishing foreign trade, its successes were celebrated loudly. Hatshepsut's mortuary temple in Deir el-Bahri features a commemoration of her sending a trade delegation to Punt, which is largely believed to be somewhere on the Horn of Africa. Crossing the Atlantic twice and returning with goods as exotic as coca and tobacco would surely have warranted at least a hovering pyramid or two. Plus, hi, maize? The Egyptians would almost certainly have taken an interest in fruits, vegetables and grain crops and not just narcotics, but they don't seem to have ever imported foods from so far afield at any point. Heyerdahl had an agenda. He wanted to prove that early civilizations interacted and that it might have been physically possible for them to do so. But the ancient Egyptian agenda was not to foster transoceanic cooperation. The Egyptian people were loath to roam far from the Nile, even by land. An ocean is just another kind of desert, and there's no evidence they even roamed as far as the other side of the Mediterranean. When they wanted increased trade with the Greeks in the 6th century BCE, the Egyptians invited the Greeks to settle in the Delta region to facilitate that trade. The Egyptians gave a town away rather than go on a sea voyage. So, okay, we have a possible but somewhat unlikely hypothesis, with some evidence we'd like to see missing from the Egyptian records. How else can we explain the Egyptians having cocaine in their mummified remains? The plants that give cocaine in South America provide it readily and in significant quantity, but they're not the only plants able to produce the substance. The genus, which is known to produce cocaine, Erythroxylum, has over 200 species. As recently as 2005, 14 cocaine-bearing species within that genus were discovered that had never been tested for their ability to produce cocaine. The genus has species spread all over the tropics, including Western and Southern Africa. It's not implausible that the Egyptians could have had access to these species, or even another that was native to Egypt or close by. Many plant species are gone from the world that were common in ancient times, and we know that Egypt was trading, at least indirectly, as far afield as Afghanistan, the primary source of its precious lapis lazuli. Perhaps the popular Roman culinary and medicinal herb sylphium was a source of cocaine. In all likelihood not, there's a certain degree of confidence what sort of plant sylphium was, but my point is there were species then that are gone now. Even very common ones. I would say the low amounts of cocaine in these mummies don't necessarily point to a plant that was native to Egypt. Cocaine's properties are pretty strong, the Incan civilization was fueled by it, and I think that if the Egyptians had ready access to it, we'd know. For sure Herodotus would have noted that the source of Egyptian magic was this enchanted leaf they were always chewing. He might even have speculated that they were using the strength and endurance cocaine granted them to build monuments. All I'll say to that is this, Egypt definitely has cocaine now, and there aren't any new pyramids being built. Checkmate straw man Herodotus, who never said the thing I'm checkmating him for. Criticisms of Balabanova's findings that mention cocaine being an exclusively South American compound might be flawed, but is it a slam dunk? At the sub-forensic levels Balabanova reported, I don't think so. I still think contamination or misinterpretation is the most likely explanation for the cocaine result. I think we're all willing to apply contamination as an explanation for the nicotine findings. These mummies were often stored in private collections, and, well, people smoke. 
Nicotine's evolved biological function is as a pesticide, and nicotine-based pesticides are still a thing humans use, though they're decreasingly commercially available. A museum spraying its most moth-friendly exhibits with something of that kind isn't implausible at all, though in theory Balabanova's methodology should have removed any external substances from the tissue samples, leaving only what was within the tissues. This brings us back to contamination, misinterpretation, or just accurate and hard to explain results. Oh damn, I never got round to doing my awesome high seas joke. Oh, okay. <clears throat> what were they, sailing the high seas? Meh. Egyptian contact with South America appears on the face of it to be physically possible, but the Egyptians weren't the Europeans of the 15th century onwards, striking forth to plunder what they could. They liked to stay as close to home as possible. Furthermore, South America has a lot more biodiversity than simply a few psychoactive substances, a great deal of which would be of interest to the ancient Egyptians. It's fairly difficult to imagine the Egyptians arriving in South America, spotting some local farmers drinking coca tea and chewing tobacco, and taking no interest in the many edible crops being cultivated. There's no evidence that contradicts the idea directly, but with everything we know so far, the idea of transatlantic Egyptian exploration is pretty poorly supported. On the other hand, we have tropical plants on the Egyptian side of the Atlantic that could well be producing low levels of cocaine from parts of the world that Egypt would have had trade access to at the time the so-called cocaine mummies were made. To get from the possibility of transatlantic contact to the fact of transatlantic contact, we need a fair bit more evidence to change our conception of how the Egyptians approached exploration and trade, and that would probably entail at least some signs of cultural exchange between the two continents. I think until some slam dunk is scored, we can quietly disregard the idea of ancient Egyptian transatlantic trade. Okay, so maybe the Egyptians were using cocaine, but not much and it was from sources native to other parts of Africa or Asia. It's possible. Erythrozylum is found all over the tropics. It's very clear that not every species of erythrozylum has been tested for its cocaine-bearing properties. But, look, I'm not encouraging anyone to consume unlawful or potentially harmful substances. But cocaine's effect on humans is pretty strong, and obviously has some short-term benefits. Ask the indigenous peoples of South America. I would say that if the Egyptians discovered such a thing, they might have tried to cultivate it themselves. This would result not only in higher concentrations of the stuff in the Balabanova mummies, but probably also more mummies with cocaine in their tissues found elsewhere. Where are either of these things? Now, okay, the Egyptians sometimes missed a trick. Egypt actually had emeralds, for instance, though it's debatable whether they were either found or mined until the Ptolemaic period, even though mines in the same area had probably been producing copper for millennia before. It's possible cocaine's properties were misattributed to something else, the way we tend to think of vanilla as sweet, simply because it's almost always paired with sugar. But again, we can't get away from the question, where are all the other cocaine mummies? Okay, so maybe the cocaine wasn't present when the mummies were made, or when they were alive, because the Egyptians didn't have access to it. It formed over time as a result of chemical denaturation, oxidation, fermentation, whatever, which we know that certain substances can do. THC, the active ingredient in cannabis, for example, can form when certain plant resins are burned together. I don't have much to say about this one, it's plausible sounding. The thing is that while mummification methods did evolve over time, so maybe we could explain that this was the outcome of only a specific methodology from a specific locality in a specific time period, the Munich team studied mummies that ranged from the 11th century BCE to the 4th century CE, and found cocaine in almost all of the mummies studied. So again, sorry to repeat myself, but where are the rest of the cocaine mummies? That question leads us to our fourth conclusion. The one I think is the most likely, given both the evidence we have and the evidence we are yet to have. Experimental error, or pre-experimental contamination. See, right at the beginning I told you that errors in producing or interpreting results are quite often the explanation for weird findings. If you have a sinking feeling in your heart right now, if you're disappointed by this tantalising idea of ancient Egyptian cocaine that I'm taking away from you, well, I get it. 
and we all want the exciting thing to be true. It doesn't make it more likely to be true though. There are just too many ways to get a false positive on these tests for us to be able to dismiss experimental error. And it would answer the question I keep asking, where are the other cocaine mummies? Well, there aren't any. There never were any. Either the mummies sampled, or the samples tested, or the test results were corrupted in some accidental way, and I'm definitely suggesting an accident to be clear. More damning than that, even if another lab performed the same tests on the same mummies and got similar results, the cocaine concentrations detected would still be below the threshold most labs would consider a definitively positive result. On the other hand, there were results of zero in the Bell Beaker and Sudanese remains. The methods of the Munich team were clearly theoretically capable of finding no cocaine where no cocaine is to be found. And maybe we should have a little bit of a misgiving about the fact that the experimental error hypothesis requires us to doubt some of the results, but not all of them. It is the job of rigorous science to be sceptical of surprising results, because science has the job of defending its models with the available evidence until new evidence repeatedly contradicts those models. Or, to put it more snappily, good science is resistant to changing its theories, but not immune to changing them. While the Council paper casts what seems like reasonable doubt over the most surprising result, the presence of cocaine in Egyptian mummies, it explicitly points out that the Peruvian result is unsurprising. But if the same method was used for all samples, then why doubt one result over the other? Perhaps the samples were contaminated before arriving at the lab, they were all stored in different facilities after all. But crucially, that is just as much speculation without hard evidence as the suggestion that Egyptians ventured across the Atlantic. It's much less wild speculation, of course, and asks less of our imagination, but still, it is a hypothesis that can be tested. All of this is to say, more testing should be done. Right now, I think my Occam's razor is pointing in the direction of prior contamination of the samples in question, which is boring and a bit sad. I'm not saying I wanted to prove the existence of transatlantic ancient Egyptian trade, but I guess I thought the world would be more interesting if the ancient Egyptians had access to a substance that's a pretty useful medicine in the right hands. Here's the thing about video essays, all essays really, they're not meant to be the final word on a subject. If the pyramids start to hover tomorrow, if Precambrian rabbits show up the day after that, if new cocaine mummies show up whose results can't be explained by contamination, that will change things. Opinions are supposed to change in the light of new evidence. But at this point, the evidence needs to be overwhelming because it needs to account for all of the non-cocaine mummies. For now, I'm confident in saying that the ancient Egyptians didn't make contact with South America, and that the primary piece of evidence that this happened, the cocaine mummies, is more easily taken as evidence of experimental error or the strangeness of organic chemistry. Maybe something new will turn up that will open the case back up for me and in the minds of actually qualified scientists. Now that really would be a home run. Thanks so much for watching, particularly if you're still here right at the end. This project took a lot of work, it was definitely outside my armchair, and I learned a lot doing it. I hope you learned something as well. Uh, please do let me know what you think about the video in general, but also the things I discussed in it in the comments. There are a lot of complex ideas in this topic, and I know I didn't cover all of them, so I'd love to know what you think. Also, let me know if you want to see more of this in-depth, more analytical style of video. I enjoyed making it a lot, but it only makes sense to keep doing so if you liked watching it. If you did like watching it, please click that little thumb. It helps recommend my videos to more people, and I appreciate every view and like. And as I said, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. I'm trying to get to a thousand by the end of January in time for my special anniversary collaboration. My title graphics and background are by Lazy Honeybee, and my character design is by Lazy Honeybee and Praxis Descends. Their details are on screen and in the description. My theme music and the background music I used in most of the video was by Sassy Dragon. You can check out her SoundCloud and Twitch channel, and I highly recommend that you do. The research and writing was done by me, Lucas, the armchair Egyptologist. I'm a freelance writer by day, and I've written videos for not only my own channel, but as a ghostwriter for others. So if you think you might have need of my services, my business email address is in the description. 
you can never have too much patron thanks, so once again, thank you to my backers at patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. It's a great group of people, and it's growing all the time, and I'd love to welcome some new folks to that list of founding members. Until next time, my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity, and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.